I'm Kendall. Thanks for checking out this message today. We're glad you're here and we would love to get connected with you and your family. One easy way to do that is to text River Connect to 97000. You can also visit our website at theriverchurch.cc to learn more about us and some upcoming events. Lastly, if you would like to give to the River Church today, you can text the amount you want to give to 84321, or you can head to our website and click the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoyed today's message. Again, for those of you who just joined us this morning, my name is Roy Townsend. I'm the Grow Pastor, and it is my privilege today to be able to share this message with you. But more importantly, or very importantly, over the next few weeks, I'm working with Pastor Jason. I'm working with him to encourage the church to gather together lots and lots and lots of candy, all right, for our trunk or treat. It's pretty important as to what we're going to be doing. We're going to have 1,500 to 2,000 visitors come through the building that weekend. And we, he called me the other day and he goes, hey, you know, he kind of snickered. He goes, uh, I want to do a contest to see who gets the most candy. Whoever gets the most candy is going to get a pie in the face in front of the church. And I said, okay, okay, I'll do it. You know, he twisted my arm. Don't you feel bad for me? He's like, oh, it's all for the little kitties. Ha, 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 ha. He thinks he's going to win. And I'm like, how are you so sure that you're going to win? And I've got to tell you, I've been worried about the moving of candy back and forth between the two sides. I'm thinking about setting a camera up, a ring camera, because... I did catch Pastor Jason inside the bins. I have a picture. Okay, we have a pic. See? <laughs> he has already been inside the bin. Look at all that candy on top of him, and that is all on my side now. What is going on? What is going on? I don't even understand. But it's all good fun. We're having a lot of fun with it. So we do need your help when it comes to our, our trunk or treat. We need your help. We need you to invite little ones and their families to the trunk or treat. We need you to be in prayer that the right people would show up so that we have the opportunity to minister to them in a mighty way. We want to pray that there be fewer distractions to our presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We know there'll be distractions, right? It's a room full of kids. But we know that we will have that opportunity. We, we pray that the volunteers would show up. We need the volunteers to show up to pull off this event. So if you could do that, if you could be in prayer, if you can bring candy, if you can invite others, please consider doing that. We are pretty excited about it. And I'm gonna be honest, if you wanna put the candy in Jason's side, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. Yeah, I saw a few of you. People are like, don't look, I'm putting it in your side. I see how you guys are. That's all right. But I am blessed this morning to share with you from Matthew chapter 6. So you could turn there if you'd like. Matthew chapter 6. It's an exciting day for the church to be together. It's an exciting day. We don't want to take today for granted. Right? We are talking about an exciting opportunity that 2,000 people are going to be going through our building our women's retreat is going on right now in Holland, Michigan, and we have over 100 ladies that are there and being taught and growing in community, being taught from God's word. We don't want to take it for granted. If you're new here or you're just catching up, we are in our Sermon on the Mount series, teaching from Matthew 6. But many of us have been here and we realize that, you know, two years ago, we covered the Beatitudes. Last year, we covered the rest of Matthew 5. This year, we'll be covering Matthew 6. And next year, we already have started Matthew 7. There's a lot of important teaching that we need to be focused in on, that we need to be ready and we need to be prepared Last week, Pastor Jason, he challenged us on our sincerity and our honesty, our cleanliness, I guess you could say, our purity of our motives in our walk with Christ. When it comes to our walk with Christ, it must be sincere. 
It must be real. It's more than knowing the right thing to say or the right thing to do. It's about truly believing. It's about being sincere in that belief that our motives could be in line with God's motives. Matthew chapter six, verse one says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. I don't know about you, but I've been in meetings with people, right? As a profession, I was in meetings, right? And I'm sitting there, and I remember sitting with this other person that I was working with, and we're talking, and every few seconds in my talking, they're like, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, uh uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh huh. And then I knew by the 12th or 13th, uh huh, that they had no idea what I was talking about. I knew that that affirmation was not sincere. I knew, you know, kind of like sometimes when you're talking to kids nowadays, right? And adults, we all love our phones, right? A lot of us have our phones out. Then you're talking and they're like, mm hmm. And then, what did you say? Right? It was an insincere, insincere affirmation. And so sometimes I know that when I'm reading the scriptures or sometime when the pastor's giving the sermon and he's talking about the scripture, we're like, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, double yes, yeah, 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 yeah. And there, for many of us, let's say, it's an insincere response. It's an insincere affirmation. We have no intention of doing what is being taught. We all seem to understand that when you look at something, it's incongruent. You know, when your actions or your language is incongruent with how you've been taught or what you say you believe. Growing up, my family's from Kentucky. We used to love this. Uh, In Michigan, smoking was against the rules in church. But when I go to my family's home in Kentucky, we grew, as a family, grew tobacco. So on Monday through Friday, when I went to Christian school, you know, smoking's wrong, smoking's wrong, smoking's wrong. I'd be in church on Sunday morning, and I'm not kidding, they had a smoke break in the middle of the church gathering. And it was always funny to me because it seemed so incongruent, right, with what I was being taught because it was good preaching on Sunday. It seemed incongruent that this could be a problem for many people in the congregation, even if they grew the tobacco, right? I understand that it's their livelihood. I understand that it would be a different situation. So we all understand this. And Pastor Jason continued it up with Matthew 6, verses 2 through 4. He said, Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as do the hypocrites, excuse me, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. And when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. It's interesting. That was the foundation of Matthew chapter six and today we're gonna continue that I'm really gonna be teaching a lesson on how not to pray. So so, oh, you're kind of a negative preacher, right? How not to pray. That's what the scripture starts with. It starts with how not to give, how not to demonstrate your righteousness, and how not to pray. Some of you are like, hey, I understand how not to pray. I already got that one down. I just don't. Well, for those of you who do, We're gonna talk about what those trip up areas are when we're talking about our prayer life. 
But this incongruent, you know, and I know that's a weird word, you know. I think of this often. Deal with a lot of couples that are getting married. And, you know, one of my first questions is, oh, have you gotten the ring, right? Or have you given her the ring? Or if I see her for the first time, it's like, oh, yeah, hey, what's going on? That ring looks heavy, right? Let me see the ring, right? It's all about the ring. And it's interesting because you really expect that their excitement about the ring will be a token of the love that they share for the person that they're marrying. How incongruent would it be when I asked her about the ring and instead of, oh, you know, he gave it to me. How weird would it be if like, oh, you know, this is, uh, this is titanium. This is, this, is, this is expensive stuff. And, and the diamond is of this quality. And the diamond is of this weight. And the diamond is in this setting. And the diamond is this cut. And I'm not saying that those things aren't important, but you know what? Never has that been the response. And I praise the Lord. Because if the response had been all about the token of the love and not about the love, that seems incongruent to me. It doesn't seem to match up. So, as we begin this part of our lesson, Matthew chapter six, verses five and six. It says, and when you pray, you must not pray like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. As I've studied up on this passage, I was reminded that the emphasis of this section of Matthew chapter 6 deals with the relationship between us and our worship of God. Don't let your righteousness be seen for the wrong reason. Don't draw attention to yourself when you're giving to the needy. When you pray, don't be like these hypocrites don't be like them where they work on this and they, they want the attention drawn to themselves. There, there's a warning here. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. Dealing with these warnings. This is actually the second warning. Last week, the people the warning was about giving to the needy. Jason mentioned that there may be other people here, right, that could be non-believers who don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but as they look around the room and they see how we talk and they see how we act, they could be putting on that mask to pretend to be a Christ follower. Then you have those of us who maybe we have come to know Christ and we're in our faith with Christ, but we don't like how we look in our walk. And we might put on a mask to pretend. When I do a lot of family counseling, counseling this is one of the first things that comes up over and over and over again. I'll sit down and I'll talk with the kids and they're like, you won't believe the fight that we got into on the way to church. You will not believe the words that were said and the names that were called. But when we hit the bottom of the steps, buddy, we got a smile on. We're not going to let anybody in the church know. We're not going to let anybody in the church body know that we're having a difficulty or we're having trouble. We're going to put that mask on. One of the things I love about our church is we don't worry about how people dress, but sometimes when I was growing up, it was more about what it looked like than what it actually was. Well, as long as if it looked like a good family, as long as it looked like they were 
connected with the gathering and connected with the church body, as long as it looked like that, well, that can be the problem of being a hypocrite. Our lesson talks about how this hypocrite, if we take it back to the root word, it's about wearing a mask. And in ancient times, when they had a play, instead of makeup and dressing up and all this different things that they would do to be that person in a play, they would wear, put a mask over their face and everyone knew what the mask represented in the storyline. And that would be how they would act. So this hypocrite is about putting on a mask. This hypocrite is about pretending, play acting. Maybe even for today, I heard one commentator say play praying. But I hear this all the time about the church. Just a bunch of hypocrites. Just a bunch of hypocrites. And sometimes I have to push back and I'm like, if you're asking me, do I fail? The answer is yes, I fail. If you're asking me if I sin, the answer is yes, I sin. Failing and sinning doesn't make you a hypocrite. It makes you a human. So whenever, oh, just a bunch of hypocrites, I'm like, okay, well, what institution do you like? Well, I like the VFW, just a bunch of hypocrites. Well, I like my Corvette club, just a bunch of hypocrites. Well, I like my employer, just a bunch of hypocrites. If that's your definition of hypocrite, you have the wrong definition. I enjoy telling people when I say, come to our church, I'm like, come as you are, just don't stay that way. That's me included. Come as I am this morning, but hopefully through my interactions and prayers and the teaching and the preaching and the Holy Spirit and our time together as a gathering, that I don't stay the way I came. That I'm encouraged and I'm ministered to and I'm strengthened and I pray with others and I confess and I work on. That's not being a hypocrite. So when we get to this word, we have to really say, okay, it's not just failing and falling short. What is a hypocrite? One of the commentators I enjoy is Warren Wiersbe, and he stated that Jesus warned about the danger of hypocrisy, which was the sin of using religion to cover up sin. A hypocrite deliberately uses religion to cover up his sins and promote his own gains. So now I'm understanding, if I were to stand up here and tell you that I don't struggle, that's being a hypocrite. If I say, oh, I'm so close with God and Jesus has removed all my struggles, so that you feel badly because you still struggle, that's a hypocrite. We have to be careful. A hypocrite deliberately uses religion. And Christ has said over and over and over again in our last two meetings on the Sermon on the Mount, our last two series, he said, you have heard it said, but I say to you, you may have heard it said that if you didn't actually murder somebody, you're a good guy. But I say, if you hated them so bad you wanted to murder them in your heart, you did it. You say that if you didn't actually have a physical relationship outside of marriage, that you're not an adulterer. But I say to you, if you desire to in your heart, you did. He's changing the way. So these Pharisees, when they were demonstrating their righteousness and drawing attention to themselves, he is again saying, but I say to you, this is how it's supposed to be done. So Matthew chapter six, verse five, we wanna read it again. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. Pastor Chuck said in the lesson for this week, he says, notice that he didn't say, if you pray. 
For us as his people, it's not if you're going to pray, right? It's when you pray. Now, some of you I know, same thing. You don't got to worry about this. I don't pray in public. I, I have no desire. As a matter of fact, I, I get that a lot when we say, hey, would you be willing to pray? No. I'm like, wow, that was a quick no. Is this a soft no or is this a hard no? Is this a yeah, 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 you heard me or not, right? What? Well, you say, well, what do you mean? Well, it says not if you pray, it says when you pray. Again, these religious leaders, right? They were taking this opportunity to say, Watch me, look at me, right? We remember our kids, right? Little kids and toddlers and, you know, all the way up through adolescence, right? When something good happens, have you ever had them say, oh, look at me, right? When I come home and I'd been yelling at the kids maybe for clean your room, right? And five days later when they actually clean their room, you want to come see my room? No, I wanted to see your room five days ago. But I couldn't see your room five days ago, Right? It's, it's inbred in us. You know, I've said this before. I had a friend who used to say it a lot, and I really enjoy it. He says, I might not be much, but I'm all that I think about. That's how self-focused we are. You know, watch me now, right? There's a song a few years ago, you know. Watch me now, watch me now. I'm doing this, right? Well, we have to realize that this is what was happening. The Hughes wrote this. He said, opportunities for their street corner performances came at a time on the daily afternoon of the temple sacrifices and during the public fasts. And when the trumpets were blown as a sign that it was time to pray, wherever a devout man was on the street, he stopped, he faced the temple and prayed. What a perfect opportunity for watch me now. Watch me now. Look at me. Look what I'm going to do. I will show you, right? These prominent men, they would do things, right? They would, they would be dressed up. They would use fancy words. They would raise their hands or maybe get down on the ground, make a big demonstration so that people could watch me. Not an act of worship to him, but watch me. Watch me what I can do. Look how good I am. We have to be very careful because we know that we still fight this in our culture. We know. And I, you know, it's really interesting to me as I studied up on this, you know, if you were gonna do this so that you could get the biggest audience. The authors, all the commentators that I read talked about, you know, hey, you know, they would even pick really good roads so that people could watch them, right? If you were going to want people to watch you, are you going to be at the corner of Tubbs Road and Jones Road where a car goes by every five minutes? No, I'm going to be at Airport Road and M59, I'm going to be at Dixie Highway and Walton Boulevard, right, where there's a half a mile back up every day at 5 o'clock, and I'm going to be there on the corner in my best dress with my perfect words ready, raising my hands, making a big demonstration to say, watch me. Look at me. We know this was a problem. The scripture records it over a few times. It says Luke, in Luke 18, verses 10 through 14, not only did they do this on the way to the synagogue, but they would also do it at the synagogue where they would take the prominent position. And when it came time to pray, maybe run up in a power of position, right? And demonstrate this. And in Luke 18, verses 10 through 14, We see it says, two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus. Standing by himself, when I I started digging into that, it's talking about being in a prominent position. You'll notice there's not a ton of people in the front row, right? So taking a, a front row position so that when he stands, he would be by himself 
to let everybody know what's going on. And this is what he prays. He says, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer or even like that tax collector way back there. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. I know today this could be a hard thing. People are like, I, I, Roy, I don't know that I struggle with this. The sin of focusing on ourself and the sin of pride and the sin of trying to be recognized or desiring to be recognized, I think we're deluding ourselves or we're faking ourselves out if we don't realize that this is still a problem. Matthew 6, verse 6 says, But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. I've had people say, look, there shouldn't be corporate prayer. There shouldn't be prayer in public. Look what Jesus is teaching here. Let's see what's happening. Sermon on the Mount. We would tell you that in the instructions for public worship come from the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 2. He gives this instruction. He says, first of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. So prayers and supplications and intercessions and thanksgiving is to be made for our leaders as part of public worship. So we know that it is not wrong to pray in public. We also know that it's also important that we pray in private. But what would be the problem with praying in public? If I only pray in public, but I don't pray in private, that would be a hypocrite. If I'm willing to pray in public, if I'm willing to sit in the front row and get up and pray in public and say, look at me, right, that's wrong. But it's also hypocritical, even if I do it for the most part correctly, if I'm unwilling to be praying in private. And remember, it wasn't if you pray, it was when you pray, church. Our Lord practiced private prayer in Mark 1.35. It says, speaking of Jesus, it says, And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. One commentator wrote, he said, The secret to understanding this verse is the word secret. The secret to sincere prayer the reward to this sincere prayer is that the only eyes on you in that time, that private prayer, are those of God. And so there needs to be this habit of praying in private, not praying for when other people would see you. It can even be this way in your family. You say, what do you mean? Have I ever been tempted when I got up and I saw my kids, my kids are getting up? Man, if I started reading my Bible right now, wouldn't that be a good thing for them to see? But if the only reason I'm reading my Bible is so that my kids can see me reading my Bible, if it's not a habit of mine to be reading my Bible in personal devotion, then I'm a hypocrite. 
If I'm only praying with my family at a meal and forcing them to pray at a meal and I don't have a habit of private prayer in my life, I'm only doing it so they, when they see it, if that's the motive, then I'm a hypocrite. When we go back to the original warning in Matthew 6, Matthew 6, verse 1, it says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. He knows your heart. He knows your desires. He knows your reason. One commentator wrote, he said, when we honestly face the truth of this, it is sobering, even terrifying, when we do works of mercy. Do we play to the crowd? However small it may be, when we pray, do we pray to God or do we pray for men? Asking ourselves these questions can be painful. Growing up, my parents instilled in us, we had a ministry, for lack of a better term, to older people. So, uh, I'm very comfortable with older people. I'm becoming one, right? I better get, better get comfortable with it. But I'm very comfortable because my, my mom, we would help older people. Oh, you gotta go mow their lawn. Oh, take them some food. Oh, you know, we even had a, a lady that lived across the street from us growing up, and I, I actually cherish this now, but at the time it could be annoying. When she would fall, she had a button to hit, and the button called us. And of course, she wouldn't hit the button when she fell. She would try to get herself up for five or six hours and then hit the button, you know, after I'm asleep, you know. She finally realized she couldn't do it. And then we'd have to get up in the middle of the night and run over the street and unlock the house and go inside the house. And my brother and I, and we'd pick her up, put her back in bed, ask her, is everything okay? Yep, everything's okay. We'd lock the door, hide the key, run back across the street, right? Well, my mom told me, she said, you need to go help this lady. I used to work with her. She's really, really, really poor. I said, okay. She lived in a rougher part of town, um, had a fenced-in yard. She felt very poor. She put carpeting over her car in the driveway to try to keep it from being sun-faded. She ate moldy bread. I saw her eat moldy bread all the time. And I'm like, wow, this lady is really, really, really poor. So Meals on Wheels would come by and she'd get a meal a day and and we would mow her lawn. You know, I'd drive in 15 miles to mow this lady's lawn. We're doing all sorts of things. Again, in in a bad part of town. And one day I'm mowing and I go, something goes, like hit metal, mowing right in the middle of her yard. There's green stuff, little bits of green stuff flying everywhere after I hit this metal. I'm like, well, that's weird. So I pull the lawnmower back and I start digging it up. It's a coffee can. It's a coffee can. Some of you know where I'm going with this. It's a coffee can full, full, F-U-L-L. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Of $100 bills. She lives in a bad part of town, like seriously a bad part of town. She lived there before it was a bad part of town. So immediately, my heart is like, all the way to my toes. I'm like, we're gonna die. We're gonna die. People must know that she's got $100,000 sitting here in the front yard and I just mowed over it. And immediately my mind, why is this lady eating moldy bread? 
Why, is this, why am I helping this lady put carpeting? I've never seen it done, but it does work. Carpeting over top of a car so that the sun doesn't fade the car. You know how difficult it is to get wet carpet off a car every time you want to get into the car? It's not easy. Where do you put wet, moldy carpet so that it doesn't get even more dirty so that when you get back, when you got to put that wet, moldy carpet back over top of the car? And I, it was one of the first times in my life I was just like, what is going on? This is so incongruent. This does not make sense. Life is being portrayed one way, but the blessing was in a can, and by the way, several cans, in the front yard. So weird that people would live that way. And yet, that's easy for me to say because money's just a tool to me. But when I think about what other people think about me, that's very motivating. Am I more motivated by what other people think of me? Or am I more motivated by what our God, our Father in heaven thinks of me? Many here today may say to me, Roy, I don't, I don't even understand. Maybe some hearing online, I don't understand what you're talking about, this relationship with the Father. Like some of us here, we get it, we understand, we know, we have a relationship with the Father, and this is a good warning for us. But there are some here today who may not know who Jesus Christ is, and the sacrifice that he gave so that we can have a relationship with the Father. The Apostle Paul is speaking in Acts 20, verses 20 and 21. It says, How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. A genuine repentance and a genuine faith go hand in hand. What is that genuine repentance? We don't want you to put on a mask, sir. We don't want you to wear a mask, ma'am, young person. We don't want that today. We want you to understand that if you have a genuine faith and a genuine repentance, if you understand who Jesus Christ is, you can have this relationship with the Father. Luke 24, verses 46 and 47. It says, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. We are often reminded that Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We don't want you to be misled. We don't want you to wear a mask. We don't want you to fake it. Don't fake it. Let us know that you don't believe so that we can be in prayer for someone who doesn't Believe. If you're struggling, don't hide your struggle. Because I can't be in prayer about your struggle when it's hidden behind the mask and we pretend that everything is okay. For those of us who are pretending to be extra spiritual, take off the mask. Because the reward from the Father in heaven is much more than any accolade I or the others here could give you. If we want to impress someone, impress him. 
as the audience of one. Many people, they struggle with this. What should I repent from? I'm a pretty good guy. That's just another mask. I'm a pretty good guy. Really? Man, I guess I just grew up with a healthy amount of something because I knew I was not a good guy. Maybe that was my parents telling me I wasn't a good guy. I knew that I wasn't a good guy. I knew that Romans said, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I knew that. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Don't be blinded. Don't pick up a mask. Don't hide behind the mask. Don't wear the mask. Church, don't be a hypocrite. John 3, verses 17 and 18. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes... In him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. If you are wearing this mask to pretend to be a Christian, I want you to know that you are condemned already. If we do not believe on the name of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, You are condemned already. Please don't pick up that mask. Because if you don't pick it up, our church will be more burdened to pray for your salvation. But that verse ends, verse 18, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God Jesus Christ. Will you stand, church? And we'll pray. Lord, we love you. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to share this morning. Lord, I thank you for those who are here, both online and in person. Lord, I'm thankful that you've given us your word Lord, I pray that we be reminded not to pick up these masks, not to wear these masks, not to hide behind these masks. Lord, that we would become full followers of you, that we wouldn't just follow from afar, but that we would follow so closely, that we would be a fisherman of men, that we would be a friend of yours, but always we consider our Father in secret as we pray to him, not for the accolades of others, but for his reward, which is truly eternal. We love you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.